Good evening, and welcome to the third annual conference on help, healing, and hope after loss. My name is Elizabeth Cohen, and I am the coordinator of the Jewish Healing Network. Our mission is to provide education, resources, and support to families dealing with illness and loss. The Jewish Healing Network is a program administered by the Jewish Child and Family Services in collaboration with the Jewish Federation of Chicago, the Chicago Board of Rabbis, and CJE Senior Life. This evening would not be possible without the generous support of the Lori S. Bauer Foundation for Sudden Loss. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce Scott Bauer, the founder of the Bauer Foundation, for a few words of welcome. Scott? There's stairs over here. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, welcome, everyone. This is uh, quite impressive, quite, quite a uh, phenomenal crowd tonight. So I know, Elizabeth, you and your, your staff put a lot of hard work, a lot of effort into this. And obviously, you know, it paid off. So very nicely done. Um, a little brief history of myself and our foundation. Uh, my wife passed away suddenly about four and a half years ago. So I'm, I'm in a situation much like, you know, probably many, if not all of you, are in who, who have experienced a sudden loss. And uh, shortly thereafter, um, you know, I, I was looking for resources. I was looking for outreach, uh, not only for me, but more importantly for my three boys, um, who at the time were uh, 15, 16, 14, and 11. And you know what, there, there was not a lot of help out there. There really was not a lot of help. And through the support of my family, support of friends, and the support of the community, we started this foundation to help people uh, who have experienced a sudden loss, to help them get through the daily, the mundane daily tasks of life that all of a sudden, you know, were, were thrown upon you um, in some unimaginable way. And in just four plus short years, we have established two children's grief centers. There's one in Evanston and one in Deerfield. These grief centers are fully staffed with licensed therapists who deal with specifically uh, children's grief and the loss of a parent through death, divorce, abandonment. We fully fund these centers and we don't, uh, we don't charge people that can't afford it. So all fees are set on a sliding scale. We have literally seen over 1,000 children in the past three and a half years, ages three to 18. Um, in addition, I met Elizabeth through the Jewish Healing Network and through Jewish Child and Family Services almost four years ago now, and um, you know, collaborated with them on creating programs like this that didn't exist before. That. Quite frankly, until I was thrown into this situation, and much like you know, you are, didn't know that that there was a need for it. And I and I found, and my family found, an incredible need for programs like this. So, you know, we we formed this partnership with the Jewish Healing Network, and uh, you know, Elizabeth, again, you you and your staff, and and everybody at, at Jewish Healing Network have just done an incredible, incredible job uh, by by arranging community events like this by establishing a program called Hand in Hand, which is a, a widowed grief group for spouses 55 and younger. Something that, I mean, I was looking for and, and I couldn't find it and didn't exist. And we look to continue this partnership for a, a very long time because we know that this is unfortunately a niche that uh, was was not filled and that needed to be filled. So, you know, that that's kind of a, a brief history, a brief story of myself and our foundation. Again, thank you all for for coming tonight. Again, this wouldn't be possible without you guys. And you know, I'd like to turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thank you, Scott. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank a few other people. 
Uh, Amy Rubin, who is our Senior Director of Community Services for Jewish Child and Family Service. Amy's in the back. As well as all of our colleagues uh, from the Jewish Healing Network and Jewish Child and Family Service who have uh, provided a lot of support in making this evening happen. And for those of you that don't know, tomorrow we also have a program for professionals, for mental health, clergy, chaplains, um, and we're going to be talking with um, Rabbi Levy will give a keynote, we'll have a panel. The topic is when personal and professional overlap, when the healer is hurting. That's tomorrow. And that's also with the, with the support of the Bauer Foundation. Um, so I just want to just give you a little bit of information about the evening. I'm going to ask if you could just take a minute and turn off your electronic devices for a moment, unplug. Um, so we're going to be hearing from Rabbi Levy in a few minutes. Um, after Rabbi Levy speaks, we'll have an opportunity to ask some questions. Um, and then I'm going to ask you to take a minute and fill out those evaluations that we gave you um, so that we can hear how we can improve our services this evening. Um, and then we invite you to a reception in the vestibule um, where you can, can meet other people and have an opportunity to buy, purchase a couple of Rabbi Levy's books and have her sign them for you. Rabbi Levy is a unique and passionate voice in the contemporary Jewish world. A graduate of Cornell University, she was in the first class of women to enter the Jewish Theological Seminary's rabbinical school. She is the founder and spiritual leader of Neshuva, a groundbreaking Jewish outreach organization based in Los Angeles. She is an acclaimed author, a speaker, and named to Newsweek's top 50 rabbis. Please join me in welcoming Rabbi Naomi Levy. It's really an honor to be here tonight. I I want to thank the Bauer Foundation and Scott, and I want to thank Elizabeth Cohen and her staff and um, everyone who made this whole event, not tonight, tomorrow, happen. Um, I'll share with you a little bit about me, and then um, we'll talk about loss. Um, I wanted to become a rabbi from the time that I was four years old. <laughs> and people thought this was very adorable, very cute. They would pat me on the head. Isn't that adorable? <laughs> Nomi wants to be a rabbi. Um, some people didn't think it was that cute. Some people thought it was an awful thing. And I would hear people say, don't you know girls can't be rabbis? Don't you know that? <laughs> but nothing that they said could bother me. And I was deadly serious. People have often asked me, how did such a crazy thought enter your mind as a four-year-old child? Was your father a rabbi? And I say, well, actually, my father was in the Shemata business. <laughs> um, in the clothing business. He wasn't a rabbi. But he was my rabbi. He was my teacher. He was very passionate about Judaism, very passionate about Jewish learning, about prayer. He'd schlep me to shul with him on Shabbos, and I would sit beside him, playing with the strands of his talus. And I absorbed everything he taught me like a sponge. And I continued to hold on to my dream that I would be a rabbi. But when I was 15 years old, something happened to change all that. My parents were walking down the street one night, and uh, a man mugged them. And he shot my father. And um, my father died. So many things died at that one moment. My father died. He was my rabbi, my teacher. And the truth is, in many ways, my mother died. The woman that I knew wasn't there anymore, at least not for the moment. She seemed very weak, and she was weeping, and 
It was very hard for me to accept her and her weakness. My faith in doctors died because my father was rushed to the hospital. He was rushed to surgery. He was in surgery for what seemed like an eternity, but they weren't able to save him. My faith in the police died because the police were never able to find the man who murdered my father to this day. All holidays died for all of us who have experienced the loss of a loved one. We all know that a holiday table isn't the same when somebody who should be sitting there at the table is absent. I so remember the first Pesach, we just had Pesach after my father died. And he always sat at the head of the table leading the Seder. And I remember pleading with my grandfather, my mother's father, pleading with him, Zaidi, please sit at the head of the table. And he said, no, I can't. I can't sit in your father's seat. And I just remember his chair being empty like Elijah's chair. We all know that. My belief that life was predictable died. I kept wondering what was the next tragedy that was going to strike. Of course, the cheerful, happy-go-lucky, spunky, passionate 15-year-old girl that I had been died. And I didn't know if I would ever find her again. And one more thing died that I never imagined would die. God died too. The God who protects us. The God who watches over us. Where was that God when my father was walking down the street? I simply couldn't understand how the God I loved, the God I believed in, the God I prayed to, would allow such a horrible thing to happen to such a wonderful person. I tried to stop believing in God. I tried really hard to stop believing in God, but I simply couldn't do it. For me, it was like trying to hold your breath. <laughs> you can only hold it for so long, and sooner or later, you have to take a breath. I couldn't stop believing in God. But I'll tell you something. I could hate God. I was very good at hating God. And I walked around in my teen years very angry and feeling very alone for several years. But then something happened, unexpected, actually. Over time, I uncovered for myself a different kind of faith. You know, I used to believe, I used to think that God was Superman and that we were all Lois Lane. <laughs> And that God was here to swoop down and protect good people and punish bad people. And all we had to do was call out Superman and God would be there. But now I saw that that wasn't who God is. And if evil prevention was on God's business card or if evil prevention was on God's job description, then all any of us can say is that God should be fired. And I started to see God with new eyes. And soon, slowly, slowly, instead of hating God, I could start listening. And I uncovered what I think is a faith that was deeper than it ever been before, a faith that was stronger than it ever been before, and suddenly, the dream of a four-year-old girl was resurrected before my eyes. And when I was a senior in college, the Jewish Theological Seminary, for the very first time, 
voted to admit women into its rabbinical school, and I was in the very first class of women to enter the seminary. Oh, it was like coming home, like completing a circle. And I became a rabbi, and it was like floating on air. And I became a congregational rabbi. And as a congregational rabbi, what most inspired me, probably because of my own life experience, was watching people face loss and trials and tragedies and emerge from them stronger and wiser and kinder. The truth is, my own congregants became my heroes. I had come to lead them, and I'm sure they never even realized how much they were teaching me every single day. When I was 15, 16, 17, 18, I used to feel so alone like a freak. What happened to me wasn't common among my group of friends. Often when we suffer, we feel alone. We feel alone in it. Why me, we ask. But every single day as a rabbi, people came to me with their pain, and I realized the truth. None of us are alone in pain. Scratch the surface of any gathering of people. Scratch the surface of any given family, and you will find their pain and loss. We're all in it together. It's true, in the face of loss, we each carry a list of things that have died. Maybe it's your faith, or your hope, or your dreams, or your loves, or your daring, or your optimism. In Tehillim, in the Psalms, it teaches us my, one of my favorite verses. It says, Lo amut ki I will not die while I'm still alive. I refuse to die while I'm still alive. Death is a great tragedy, but to die while you're alive, that's unacceptable. That's an unacceptable tragedy. Our obligation as human beings is to revive what can still be revived. No, we can't raise the dead, but we can resurrect those other things that have died. Our hope, our optimism, our faith. That's the beauty of Judaism. It shows us the way to healing and to hope. It asks us not to hide from our pain, but to face it. Several years ago, I was invited to be a guest on the Today Show. NBC, and somebody, one of the producers from the Today Show, she called me in advance of my appearance for a pre-interview. She was asking me about my writing and about my life, and I started to tell her when people have lost so many things die. I was talking to her, and she said, you know what? She's like very strong. I'm from New York, but she really had a New York ass. She goes, Listen, darling, <laughs> if, you, if you talk like this, I'm going to have to bump you off the show. Don't be depressing. Don't talk so depressing. You know what? Judaism says to us, life isn't a series of entertaining sound bites. Healing is a process, and it takes time. And it takes honesty. Just look at the Jewish morning cycle. It teaches us the power of time from Shiva to Shloshim to Shana, Yisker, Yurtzeit. Judaism teaches us the power of prayer. It teaches us the power of our own tears, of letting them out. It teaches us the power of community, the power of a listening ear, which is really what the Healing Network has come here for, yes? Judaism teaches us the power of rest, of what Shabbos is and how Shabbos can heal our lives. 
You know, the truth is, in my writings, I've been so overwhelmed the way Gentiles have responded to Jewish wisdom. And I remember when, with one of my chapters, um, Parade Magazine, that's that schmata that <laughs> comes in the newspaper, they said they, um, they uh, wanted to publish an excerpt from my book. I thought, well, what universal theme, you know? No, no, no. We want to publish the piece about Shabbat. And they did. Two weeks later, I get a call from the Oprah show. Oprah wants you to come on to talk about spirituality. I said, oh, I can talk about all sorts of things, general, universal themes. No, no, no. Oprah wants you to talk about Shabbat. Great. So I come on Oprah, and I talk about the power of Shabbat, of unplugging, of rest, about turning off the TV. And Oprah seemed to like everything I was saying, except for turning off the TV. <laughs> <laughs> Judaism teaches us the power of learning. The great Dr. Louis Finkelstein once taught, when I pray, I speak to God. When I study, God speaks to me. Judaism teaches us the power of memory. Zachor, Yisker. I was once in a gathering in LA, and we came to hear the Dalai Lama speak. It was a bunch of rabbis that they brought together. The Dalai Lama came to us, and he said, do you want to know the truth? The reason I'm here? The reason I'm here is because I want to know your secret. Your secret. And I was wondering, what does he mean, our secret? He wanted to know how the Jewish people have been exiled for their, from their land for 2,000 years, and still they remain intact as a people. For the Dalai Lama, this is not a hypothetical question as the exiled leader of his people. And as I was sitting in the audience, what came to me was the power of memory. We are a people that knows how to remember. We remember. We remember our loss. And we remember our brokenness. And we remember our humble beginnings. Why? Because our very brokenness is our strength. Right? The ahafta et Love the stranger because you were a stranger. And then we remember that there is a place within us that can never be broken or shattered, a place that even death has no power over, the eternal soul within us, within you and within me, and within those who have loved, that we have loved and lost. Often when we're suffering, we ask, why did this happen? And the truth is, honestly, I've never heard an answer to that question that has satisfied me. And so far, God has never come down to clarify it. The question that I've tried to answer for my own life and for those who have come to me in pain is not why, it's how. How can I live the most beautiful, the most meaningful life in the face of all the questions that, never, that may never be answered? How do we learn to put back the pieces of our shattered life? How? Because I believe with every fiber of my being that God has given us the power to rejoice again, to find life and love and hope again. So um, tonight I would like to share with you some thoughts that are actually part of a new book I'm working on. And it's about the power 
of blessings. Okay. Blessings. Blessings. I grew up in New York. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. Anybody from Brooklyn? Lanceman. I grew up in Borough Park, almost uh, exclusively Hasidic neighborhood in Brooklyn. I grew up in a home filled with food. <laughs> shh, shh, shh. Focus. <laughs> shh. Shh. I grew up in a home filled with food and love and laughter and music and Yiddishkeit and stories. I was the youngest of four kids, and we were part of a tribe in Borough Park, Brooklyn, with my mother's brother, Uncle Nat, and his family living on top of us, and my mother's other brother, Uncle Ruby, and his family living next door to us, and my mother's parents, my grandparents, living on top of them. We were all interspersed, and we were, we were totally enmeshed, and no boundaries at all. Um, you didn't, nobody even um, rang the bell to come into the house. Everybody had the key, and you didn't even knock. You just walked in on somebody else's life. Um, my parents were soulmates. They were constantly singing in harmony, walking hand in hand. And as I grew up, one by one, my older siblings moved out and went off to college. My sister is 11 years older than me. My, my, my sister Mimi is 11 years older than me. My brother Danny is 9 years older than me. My brother David is 6 years older than me. So they were quite a bit older than me. My parents always said I was a pleasant surprise. <laughs> um, so they went and, grew, and went off to college. And pretty soon, it was just me and my mom and my dad living together. It was quieter, but it was beautiful. And as I've already told you, when I was 15, my father was murdered. So then it was just me and my mom living together. And as you can imagine, the two of us became unnaturally close, the way two broken hearts have to figure it all out together. When I was in high school, I tried so hard never to cry. I didn't want to add to my mother's sorrow. So instead, I threw myself into my studies. I was such a studious kid, such a nerd. I'd always work myself into a tizzy before an exam. And then I'd turn to my mom on the day of the test, and I'd say, Mom, bless me for the test. And bless my pen, too. <laughs> and she'd say, no, me. Don't you know I'm a good witch? I know how it is, and I know how it will be. And then I would take my blessed pen and scurry off to school. And then it came time for me to go to college. Honestly, I don't know how she found the strength to send me off to college. How do you send your fourth child off when you have nothing at home but memories of a life that once was? I don't know how I left, but I did. And I hated it. It was a culture shock to go from Borough Park, Brooklyn, and an Orthodox Yeshiva High School to Cornell University. It was so Gentile <laughs> and so preppy. I'd never seen so many headbands and topsiders in my life. So I started calling my mom every night, crying hysterically. I want to go home. I don't like it here. And she was so strong. She'd say, Nomi, I want you to stay. Trust me. I'm a good witch. And then she'd bless me for my upcoming test. And she was right. After six months, and 15 pounds. <laughs> I did learn to love college, and I made new friends, and I loved the learning. She was right about so many things. She knew that my husband Rob was the right man for me even before I knew it. Trust me, she said, I'm a good witch. He's a keeper. 
And she walked me down the aisle at my wedding, just the two of us, me and my mom, hand in hand. And she gave me away again. It was hard for her to let me go and live so far away from home. And then the widow with the broken heart became a bubby with a full heart and a full schedule of friends and grandchildren and volunteering and studies and her bat mitzvah at age 80. At her birthday celebration, just when we thought she was going to make a speech, she turned around to me and she said, no me, I want you to bless me. All those years as a rabbi, I spent giving blessings to others. All those years, she'd been blessing me. I had never blessed her. So I placed my hands on my mother's head and I blessed her. How can I describe for you what passed between us? And from that day on, it became our ritual. She'd call me every single night and ask me for her blessing. She had trouble sleeping, so I'd bless her. I'd say, Mom, I bless you with peace. I bless you with sleep through the night. Sweet dreams. She had various ailments, her eyes, her legs, her feet, her asthma, her stomach. I'd call and I'd say, Mom, how are your giblets doing? <laughs> she'd laugh, we'd talk, and then she'd say, No, me, I need my blessing. And I'd bless her. I'd say, Mom, I bless you with peace. I bless you with sleep through the night. Sweet dreams. I found myself saving her voicemails. People were constantly complaining to me that my mailbox was full. <laughs> but I couldn't erase my mother's sweet messages. Shabbat shalom, Nomale. Happy birthday, Nomale. Shana tova, Nomale. Chag sameach, Nomale. Happy Mother's Day, Nomale. I'd say we spoke on the phone about six times a day. She wanted to know the details. If it was a Friday of Nashuva, that's the spiritual community that I lead, she'd call first to bless me and wish me good luck, and then she'd ask, so what are you going to talk about tonight? And then there were the wrap-up calls. So new, how was Nashuva? How did it go? How was your sermon? Was it well received? How many people came? If I was traveling to speak out of town, I'd get a call in the taxi on the way to the airport. We'd talk and then I'd say, I've got to go, Mom. I'm going through security. And she'd say, OK, call me on the other side. <laughs> I'd call and we'd chat. I'd board the plane. I've got to go. They've closed the cabin doors. OK, call me when you land. We talk in the taxi on the way to the hotel. Tell me about your hotel room. Is it nice? What are you going to talk about tonight? And then there were the wrap-up calls. So new, how did it go? What did you talk about? Was it well received? How was the crowd? She enjoyed these wrap-up calls so much that I found myself telling little white lies. How was the crowd? Packed. She'd say, Standing room only? Yes, Mom, standing room only. Were you a hit? Yes, Mom, a big hit. Was it a wow? Yes, a definite wow. A few years ago, I was invited to teach at a retreat for rabbis. They asked me to come and teach them about prayer. At the end of the session, I said, you know what? I want to teach you how to bless each other. I said, we rabbis spend our lives blessing other people. Who blesses us? They said, Naomi, what are you talking about? How do we bless each other? I said, me and my mom do it every night. I told them, you can do this. And you should have seen how these grown men put their hands on each other's heads and melted into puddles of tears. Afterwards, my mom called for the reviews. <laughs> so new, how did it go with the rabbis? Were you well received? 
Was it a wow? Standing room only? And then she was dying. The truth is, for a woman who was so intimately involved in the details of her kids' life, her grandchildren's lives, her friends' lives, I don't know how she found the courage to let us go. I said to her, Mom, bless me. She said, no, Mala, you've already been given the formula. All you have to do is live it. And then I blessed her. I said, Mom, everything you needed to give, you've already given. You can go now. And I stroked her hair and I said, I bless you with peace. I bless you with sleep. And I sang her a lullaby. After she slipped into unconsciousness, I whispered to myself, Call me when you get through security. <laughs> Call me when you land. You know what? You wake up on the first day of some new diet that you just decided to start. And as a reflex, you reach out for that slice of pie or to pour yourself some cream in that cup of coffee. And you have to remind yourself, you have to almost catch yourself, oh no, I'm on a diet today. I can't do that. And as you all know, when someone you love dies, there are so many reflexes to retrain. You set the table for three, and then you forget, oh, there are only two settings now. And for me, it was training myself to stop reaching for the telephone. 10 times a day, I'd reach out to call my mom, and then I'd have to remind myself, oh, I can't call. I'd think of something I needed to tell her, and then I'd have to sit on my hands. I'd have an ashuva service, and I'd find myself asking her questions to myself. I'd say them to myself, so new, how did it go? Was it a wow? Standing room only? With time, you stop reaching. When my mother first died, a rabbinic mentor of mine said to me, he said, Naomi, the Kaddish that you say in April isn't the same Kaddish that you say in November. A friend of mine overheard this and she asked me, are there really two different Kaddishes for different months? I said, no, same Kaddish, but you're in a different place. At first, it's a Kaddish of anguish of an open wound, an empty ache. And with each passing month, it takes on a different tone and color. Some, di some days I said Kaddish like a robot. Some days I'd feel a tug. Some days I'd feel such a sweet feeling, sitting in the morning minion, wrapped in my mother's talus, the one she wore at her bat mitzvah, saying Kaddish for her. When someone close to you dies, the world says, get back to normal. But you and me, we all know better. You're not normal. You need time to heal. Take it. Time does heal. And somehow you learn to stop relying on them for wisdom and comfort. You learn to stand on your own two feet. We learn to take care of ourselves. We learn to channel them. What would he have said? What would she have told me to do? But then a birthday arrives, or a holiday, or Mother's Day, and old wounds reopen. We miss someone who should be with us. When someone we love dies, at first they may feel very far away. But then I believe we may come to see that they are actually near. Last January, I was a scholar in residence in Northern California. And at the end of my talk, 
about the Jewish view on the soul and eternity, an elderly woman came up to see me. And as she approached me, I saw that she was wearing my mother's sweater, exactly the same one, the one that my mother practically lived in. And all of a sudden, this complete stranger, she hugged me, and she broke down in tears, and she said, you've moved me so. And then she said, my name is Naomi too, and my Hebrew name is Nahama, just like you. And then she blurted out out of nowhere, you know what? I'd like to bless you. Is that OK? And I said, OK. And all of a sudden, this complete stranger I've never met wearing my mother's sweater, named Naomi Nahama, put her hands on my head and said, you're doing God's work. And I bless you with the strength and encouragement to keep bringing light to people. And then we just held each other for a long time while tears fell silently down my cheek. Blessings, blessings. Blessings are the way our eternal souls keep reaching out to one another. On the day that my son was born, I put my hands on his tiny little head and I blessed him. I said, kiddo, these hands will be blessing you forever, for your whole life long. And today he's 21 and about to graduate from NYU. And guess what? No matter where he is, at a party or at a bar, he calls me on Friday and says, I'm ready for my blessing, Mom. And I bless him just like my mother blessed me. And I always tell people, bless, bless, bless. Bless your parents, whether they're living or deceased. Bless your children. Bless your friends. Your hands will be on them forever, even when they are far away from you. Even if they are long gone, your hands will be on them always, and their hands will be on you too. Wherever we go, wherever this unpredictable world takes us, the celebrations and the losses, wherever the journey through the desert takes us, remember that someone's hands are always on your head blessing you. And may you be a blessing to others, too. May God be with you. May health and strength sustain you. May kindness and wisdom enrich you. May nothing harm you. May you be a blessing to this world. And may blessings surround you. Now and always. Amen. Thank you. I have a tissue somewhere in here. There's a box. So if anyone would like to comment or has a question. I know that you're originally from New York, Brooklyn. Thank you, Rabbi. And now you're out on the West Coast. My, as you were speaking from the early years and growing up, <clears throat> I got the vision that you at this time in life, would be an excellent chaplain with the local police department or the state police department. And have, have, my comment to you, or question, has your feelings toward law enforcement, police, have they changed in the last 25 years? I hate to put you on the spot. Leave um, it at that. No, I don't, think, I don't think the police are worthless, but I also think that they still have a lot of work to do in terms of being on top of things. And recently in our nation, 
um, knowing how to deal with things. I still think you would make an excellent chaplain. Maybe advising them and guiding them. Amen. <laughs> yes. It was a great talk, thank you. How do you deal with your own physical pain when you've lost people in your lives? And you're down to one. I'm sorry. And you're down to one. How do you deal with your physical pain? And the loss of all these people that have died. Yeah. I think that there are various things that can help us. One critical one is community. And when someone suffers a loss, I always, when I was a pulpit rabbi, I'm not exactly a pulpit rabbi right now. I can tell you a little bit more about what I do right now. But I found it very important to link people who had losses several years before together with people who had recent losses and asking them to mentor um, people who had recently had a loss. And I, I you know, it's very interesting. I, um, I, I remember visiting a comrade of mine who had just had surgery. And I said, how is your pain right now, Sam? And he said, it's funny, before you arrived, I would have said it was around a nine. But the truth is, now it seems more like a three or a four. And you know, the rabbis tell us that to visit the sick actually is to remove a 60th the of their suffering. Um, it's to cause some kind of healing. And I really uh, believe that the instinct when we have a loss, it's, it's a natural instinct, is to retreat. It's what, what we're just, we have a desire to stay away. But what we really need is to be surrounded. And uh, unfortunately, in many communities, what will tend to happen is everybody shows up for Shiva, right? And then, you know, six months later, which is really when the true intensity of the loss starts to sink in. At the beginning, you're in shock. But when the loss really starts to sink in, that's when the people have disappeared. So um, that's just one, one of many things that I can think of to help deal with our pain, both physical, spiritual, and emotional, is to receive the strength, the comfort, and the healing that can be found from others. Any other questions? Over here. <clears throat> You, you say that you need to be surrounded by others, but um, in my experience, sometimes it's very difficult because some people could not understand you. Uh, in my situation, my husband died, and 20 days late, my mom died, and one of my uh, relative, relatives told me that it's just a life. For me, it was a great tragedy. So I retreat because we was in different planets. We are living on different planets. Yeah. So it was um, yeah. not always easy to be around the people. I, Just I, yes, thank you for bringing that up. Because I think that part of the pain is that other people may not understand what we're going through at all. You know, uh, I know when I was 15, my, I mean, it was ridiculous, right? My friends were talking about sweet 16s or makeup or who knows what, right? But it doesn't matter what, what our age is, um, you're dealing with ultimate questions and your friends might be talking about what tiles to put down in the kitchen. You know, they're, they are on a different planet. And it's definitely true that there are certain people, there are people who will surprise you in the negative way. 
In other words, there are people who you expected to understand you who will say things that are inappropriate or painful or snap out of it already, you know? Um, and what I advise is often people say stupid things out of nervousness. They don't intend to hurt. They almost, they, they just want to fill a tense moment. They don't know, they know how to be with us in silence. So they want to fill it with chatter or they want to just cheer us up with chatter. But I just want to remind you this, that there will be people unexpectedly who will surprise you in the other direction. People who you never expected, people who you didn't even know, who will surprise you by coming through in a way that you never imagined. Um, I can just tell you just a really small short story. When right after my father died, my mother, like literally a week after, like right after Shiva, I went to summer camp. And my mother went to Israel a week after my father died. And she was walking around like a ghost, as you could imagine, just like walking around like a ghost. And she walked into a, a shop of embroidery, uh, like embroidered shirts. And out of nowhere, the store owner came up to her and says, I can see you're in deep pain. Um, can you have a seat right here? Don't move. And the next thing you knew, she, she rushed all of the um, patrons out of the store. And she locked the door to the store, put up the closed sign in Jerusalem. And my mother said to me, she could tell that this woman had been through some tragedy of her own. But she never mentioned that. All she said to my mother was, I can see you're in pain. If you care to speak about it, I'm here to listen. And if you don't care to speak about it, I'm here too. And all of a sudden, my mother just completely shared her soul with a shopkeeper. So you never know. And I would just say to keep the lines of communication open because sometimes the answer may come from a very strange place. Hi, it was wonderful. Uh, I wanted to ask you because I was reading in your bio that at some point you had to deal with your child being sick. Yeah. And, um, and I think that that brings up a need to find other resources within you when it's a child, even though the loss of a parent and there's just something um, just beyond understanding when a child gets sick. So I'm just wondering if there was something you can share of what helped you move through that. Um, I'm going to be talking about that tomorrow. <laughs> but I can say that... Uh, it was a very, very difficult road. And again, I, what I found were mentors in the least likely places. That help would come from the least likely places. One example was a homeless man who used to, um, you know, I, I live in Venice Beach. And he and a bunch of homeless people, when I was a pulpit rabbi, they used to sleep on the steps of the synagogue. Venice is the homeless capital of the USA. And every day he would say to me, good morning, rabbi. How are you doing, rabbi? Can I open the door for you, rabbi? Can I study with you, rabbi? And I said, we'll see. And the next day, and the next day, and the next day, he would say these things. And finally, one day, I said, listen, his name was Bo. I said, Bo, um, I gave him a few rolls of quarters. And I said, if you come to me sober, clean, showered, 
with clean clothing, we can study. And one day, Bo showed up on a Wednesday in clothing he had gotten from the St. Joseph Homeless Center, and he was showered, and he was shaved, and he was sober. And we sat down together, and I said, Bo, what is it you'd like to study? And he said, I'd like to study the book of Jonah. And I said, why Jonah? And he looked at me, he said, Rabbi, there are only two prophets who get the call and face a storm on the sea. This is the homeless guy who was sleeping on the steps of my synagogue. And he said, Noah and Jonah. Noah gets the call, and he listens, and he gets to ride out the storm in the ark. Jonah gets the call, and he runs, and he ends up in the belly of a whale. And Bo said to me, I need to study Jonah with you, Rabbi, because I'm in the belly of the whale. And what I learned from Bo was the truth of the matter is I, too, was in the belly of the whale. And I needed to find a way to see more expansively the situation that I was in with my daughter. That's what I'll say for now. Thank you. Okay. Well, Are we good? I think we're good. Thank you very much.